I've just made it through Loch Ten, and we're now about 832 kilometres from the Mays River mouth. And uh, we have coming up a short on our left, the town of Wentworth. But before we get there, we can see behind me that we have a junction in the river. Now, to my right, we have the Murray, and to my left, we have the Darling. Now, the Darling gets most of the water from the monsoonal downpours in the mountain range in northeast and New South Wales and southern Queensland. Um, when the whole area floods, it makes for one huge, gigantic inland ocean. But from this point here, the Darling stretches inland through some of the driest parts of Australia for up to 1,900 kilometres. And back when it was full of water and it was a very busy and popular place for the paddle steamers, it wasn't uncommon to see up to 92 paddle steamers a year travelling up and down the river, uh, carting wool, uh, carting wood, wool and general produce and stores for the people that lived along their banks. Now back in the 1890s, Wentworth had the largest inland river port in Australia and the mail network that covered all of western New South Wales, which includes runs from Wentworth to Melbourne, Adelaide to Wentworth along the Murray, Wentworth to Sydney and from Wentworth all the way up along the Darling River via Burke, which is an incredibly huge distance to travel and all of it was done on horseback or with a horse and cart. And the wharfs at Wentworth were the meeting place for all the steamboat crews, the graziers, roustabouts and shearers, and as well for pretty much everybody else that lived or worked in or around the town of Wentworth. Bullock teams hauled in wool from all around the countryside to be loaded aboard the steamboats and their barges, and supplies were loaded and unloaded to be taken up and down the rivers Murray or Darling to help supply the people that lived along their banks. And around the wharfs here, it wasn't unusual for the area to be shipping out over 12,000 bales of wool a year and well over 1 million pounds of export. But today, the town has a lot of other things to offer now, like their beautiful old schools, the town's jail, parks, sanctuaries, and the old, but still used, town courthouse. Now before we leave Wentworth altogether, it's worth taking another look at the Darling River. You see, it was here at a tree just like this one, about 700 metres upstream from the junction of the two rivers, that Captain Charles Sturt anchored up his wild boat on the 23rd of January, 1830 and gave the Murray River her name, and he named it after a Sir George Murray, who was at the time Secretary of the State of the Colonial Office. We're just upstream from Wentworth now and we've pulled into the town of Mildura. Now either the people here receive about 4,000 hours of sunshine a year, so already this place sounds like a pretty good spot to me. Now, it was back in 1847 that a man by the name of Frank Jenkin swam his cattle across the river here from the New South Wales side to the Victoria side and then set up camp there. And the land he did this on was known as the Yeri Yeri. But because he had no license to do so, he was then forced back uh, to the New South Wales side by the rightful owner a man by the name of Hugh Jensen. But soon after that, the land known as the Jiri Jiri became the, the very popular town of Mildura. And from that moment on, it just started to grow. This is a recreation of the original homestead built here in Mildura in about the 1880s. If you take away all the nice green grass, add about a million flies, half a million rabbits, the isolation, the heat and the dust, then you'll have some idea what it would have been like living here when this homestead was first originally built.
Well, it seems we've got a slight problem. You see, I was just talking to one of the lock guys at Lock 11 here at Middle Jura, and uh, he tells me that the river has no more water in it. So what we're going to have to do is pull the boat out of the water, pull the trail craft out, stick it on the back of the Nissan, and travel about 742 kilometres upriver back to Turumbri where there's more water. You see, the, we've had water so far because of the locks, and the locks are there, as I said before, to help regulate the water and keep a constant flow. But the locks are only good for about 40 kilometres upstream, then the river starts to look and run at its natural state, and at the moment we're in the middle of a huge drought. So um, after our next lock, which is just near Robinvale, which is lock 15, we have a stretch of about 505 kilometres to Turumbri, and there's absolutely no water at all in there. So as I said, we're going to pull the trail craft out, uh, head across the land, follow the river still. We're still going to go through all the stores I mentioned before, got a whole lot more things to cover. Just for the next 500 kilometres, the next 700 kilometres, thereabouts, it's going to be in the Nissan. Now we've just left Mildura and we're heading towards Swan Hill. And on the way there we have to go through a town called Red Cliffs. And it's there I'd like to introduce you to one huge lady and her name's Lizzie. So when we get there, I'll pull up to the side of the road and I'll let you have a look at the size of her. So this is Big Lizzie, and she was built back in Melbourne in 1919 by a man named Frank Bottrell. And he set out to build a machine that wouldn't get stuck in the sand. So the magic thing about Big Lizzie are these huge steel beams. And what they're designed to do is lay on the surface of the ground on the sand and the whole machine would then roll forward and roll over the top of it and not sink and get stuck. Now they're on the front wheels, on the back wheels, and back on the trailer. And Big Lizzie here at top speed was travelling at just two miles an hour. Don't forget to give the video a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, that way you'll get notified to all my new videos when I upload them. And if you want to contact me, you can do so through my website, the link's in the description below. See you next time.